Hi, coming to you uh, today from my deluxe accommodations here at Oakland University. Um, this is my office, I'm not exaggerating it, it is, it is a storage closet. So, um, I figured what I would do today is give you a little bit of a breakdown of the questions, just so you know what I'm asking, and um, uh, how to answer the question. So hopefully this will be helpful to some of you. Um, this is just going to be a quick one, but um, I'd like to point you in the right direction for this. Um, here you have uh, three questions for Aristotle, three questions for Hobbes, same format as the last uh, midterm, and I gave you a couple of extra days uh, with this exam. It's no longer due the fifth. I gave you that weekend for it. So, um, the Aristotle questions, uh, the first one reads, uh, present in your own words the function argument found in Book 1, and uh, discuss its purpose in the context of Aristotle's position. Now, um, what, quite, quite clearly I'm asking you to do two things here. Um, in terms of the first part of the question, um, present in your own words the function argument, examples might be helpful to you, right? Um, but be sure to show how your examples exemplify, exemplify what Aristotle is claiming. Um, it's the examples I gave on the, uh, the videos. Uh, these were limited examples, um, it, it, the, the, uh, but Aristotle is making more of a general point um, with uh, more uh, a general human function. Uh, remember, he concludes its rationality, so it's, I consider that to be a bonus for you. Uh, the second part of this um, this this question uh, has to do with uh, recall I was telling you the function argument is sort of the linchpin for Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics. It's how he's able to claim the sorts of things that he's able to claim. Um, so it's uh, in terms of what its purpose is, uh, I count at least three things that the function argument does in the context of the argument. So um, be sure to do both for this question. Now, uh, question two here, uh, discuss what Aristotle means by moral virtue or virtue of character. Um, this you get from straight uh, straight from the uh, the opening sections of uh, book two of the Nicomachean Ethics, and um, basically I want you to just define what virtue of character or moral virtue are for Aristotle. Right at the beginning section of uh, book two uh, of the Nicomachean Ethics, he distinguishes between intellectual and moral virtue. Be sure to be um, defining the the right sort of virtue. It's virtue of character or moral virtue that we're looking for. Part two of this question, um, Aristotle adds three requirements to this treatment on page 22 of the Nicomachean Ethics and discuss each. Right Now um, that's the, the weird example that he gave you uh, then to be grammarians, you must both uh, pr provide a grammatical result and provide it grammatically in terms of the grammatical knowledge in you. I believe uh, on the video I gave you sort of a uh, golf example. Right? To be good, go good golfers then you have to not only get a good shot but get a good shot based on your golf skills. Right? So um, right after I gave you that example I laid out the three, the three requirements for genuine virtue. So be sure to give me a discussion of each of the three, not just tell me what they are, tell me what he means by each of the three. Now, in question three for Aristotle here, um, it reads, in book three of the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle makes a distinction between what he calls non-voluntary and what he would consider to be properly involuntary. Discuss this distinction and why Aristotle would find it necessary to make this distinction. Now, um, this is where I was pointing out to you there is an extremely handy f uh, footnote in Book 3 of the Nicomachean Ethics. Um, he he d d winds up defining voluntary action by what it's not. Right? So he tells, uh, tells us that um, responsibility is only for the voluntary and on involuntary action comes from uh, either force right, or ignorance. Right, of a very specific and particular kind. Now, um, it's, uh, with regard to the point on ignorance, he makes a further point. Everything uh, 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 that, that is caused by ignorance is non-voluntary, but what is properly involuntary also involves dot, dot, dot. 
So that's what I'm referring to there um, in question three. So uh, hopefully that should uh, clear up what I'm asking uh, in each of those Aristotle questions. Now moving on to Hobbes here. Um, it's, uh, you probably note I start rather late in the Hobbes material. That's because it, you know, it's, this isn't one of those courses where we're just memorizing lists of definitions. Uh, what I want you to uh, take from Hobbes is just more the general swing of the argument here. So in chapter 13, um, Hobbes introduces what he calls the natural condition of mankind. That's actually the title of the chapter. Uh, claiming that this condition arises as a consequence of human nature. Discuss generally the conception of human nature that Hobbes replies, uh, relies upon. So that's part one of the question. So what are we as human beings? And describe the state of nature, right? This natural condition of mankind that arises as a result of this conception of human nature, right? So um, part one of the question, uh, the conception of human nature, what sort of beings are we? And be sure to follow his his uh, sort of definitions through that um, appetite and aversion, uh, reason, power, um, that the, the passage from 161 of your Leviathan, the restless and uh, ceaseless desire for power after power that ceases only in death, etc. Right. So uh, that's the first part of the question. The second part of the uh, the question lay out uh, just in general terms the state of nature. Right, and in this question, you're telling me how it arises from this conception of human nature. Now, uh, question two in Hobbes, question five on your list here, reads in chapter 14 of Leviathan, Hobbes introduces a distinction between our right of nature and the related laws of nature. Uh, discuss each, right? Dis uh, define, discuss the, the right of nature and um, in general terms, uh, what the laws of nature are. Um, discuss each and what sort of relationship these ideas have to one another. Note that if you don't have to offer a full account of the laws of nature, but rather generally um, introduce what they are by focusing on the first law of nature. Right. So uh, basically, this question explores a distinction between right and law, between a liberty and um, a command or obligation, right? So um, explore that distinction in that question, right? So tell me what both are and compare them, right? Um, question six, uh, or question three in Hobbes reads, Hobbes argues for the necessity of entering into a covenant of the fo following sort. I authorize and give up my right of governing myself to this man or this assembly of men on this condition that thou give up thy right to him and authorize all his actions in like manner. And that comes from page 227 of your copy of Leviathan. Discuss this covenant, uh, this covenant and what it is supposed to accomplish. Right? So that's two things. Um, describe the, uh, the, the, the covenant itself, right? What sort of agreement it, it is, uh, what it entails, and um, try to situate it in terms of why Hobbes claims it's necessary, what it's supposed to accomplish, how it's supposed to bring the commonwealth or the state of peace into effect. So now just general things to note with these questions. Make sure that um, you're answering these things fully. Uh, in all of these questions, I ask you to do a couple of things. So um, you might be uh, you might be wise to even separate your answer into uh, question two A and question two B, right, or something along those lines. But make sure um, to address uh, what the questions are asking. Um, now uh, for the online class. Um, <laughs> Uh, the, the note that I have at the top of the exam isn't so much important. Uh, it's only there because I had in the past semester a situation where somebody had, had two people had handed in identical final exams with the same name up on the upper right hand corner of the exam and they were subject to disciplinary hearing. Uh, so don't do that, we'll be fine. And finally, uh, .doc, .docx, or .txt format, I can't open WordPerfect. All right, um, if you have any questions, shoot me an email, and thank you.